those of you online, good morning to you also. Romans chapter 16, Watch According to Christ, that's the title. We will take verses 17 and 18 for the reading, and we should finish the chapter this morning. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? And those of you online, if you are able to stand, why don't you stand with us as we read verses 17 and 18. <clears throat> now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts <clears throat> of the simple. Please be seated. Well, that's why the title has in it, Watch. We'll get to the according part, not the accordion, but the according parts at verses 25 and 26. So we'll use the 17th verse as our starting point. No need to introduce this. Uh, it will speak for itself. Again, verse 17, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. Well, what inspired this shift from greeting all the saints was that love for them. You know, when you love someone, you want them protected. Uh, this, is a, this is the heart of a protective father here, telling his child, okay, remember to lock the doors. Remember to check the back seat before you get in the front seat. And you just, you know, <laughs> do you have your backup magazine with you? Uh, just wanting them to be safe. And so he's, he's greeted them and he said, Oh, I urge you, brethren, note those who are troublemakers. Because this was a solid congregation at this point in their history. You look at Rome today and you ask yourself, how long did it take before Christianity in Rome fell victim to the papacy? By the 7th century, this church allowed the darkness of the papacy to come in. The church was hijacked long before the papacy got there, a sin from which she has never recovered and never will. And so the warning is uh, very serious, very important. Heresy will be intercepted and cast out of a good church by those who love the word, adhere to the word, and mature in the faith. A brief look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, a familiar verse. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Well, that goes on in religion. It tries to ruin everything. Paul wrote to Titus, holding fast the faithful word, as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. And so he says, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division. Troublemakers are self-impressed churchgoers when they show up in the church. That Greek word for offenses, we translate it, it is translated offenses in the New King James. It is elsewhere translated stumbling block. These folks are booby traps. And that's what he's saying. Now, you look at the troublemakers that come into a church. And I didn't choose this topic this morning. It's right here. And it's a very important topic. There have been many episodes of this within my many years of ministry. You would think that they knew the Bible but they don't or they don't care what it has to say. Listen to Proverbs chapter 6, verses 14, 16, and 19. Solomon says, Perversity is in his heart. He, deceive, he devises evil continually. He sows discord. These six things Yahweh hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. It's not hard to avoid doing this. 
But there are those who do not avoid, and there are victims that fall for it. These, I have learned over the years, they detest authority, except their own. They want the authority. Matthew 18, speaking about authority given to the church. Now, this can be abused, but when it is not abused, it is a benefit to us all. Jesus said, but if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. We have disfellowship, and if they don't come under the proper authority. Paul warned the Ephesian pastors of this problem, and he said he warned them or agonized over this in prayer night and day. Acts chapter 20, verse 29. Now remember here, what's happening in Acts 20 is Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. He has already written this Roman letter, and uh, he summons the pastors from Ephesus to meet him at Miletus. Because he, if he goes to Ephesus, he's going to get caught up, and he's not going to be on schedule, and it'll mess everything up. So they come to him, and he pours out his heart to them in that 20th chapter of Acts. And he says, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Those of the Absaloms at the gate. He continues in Acts 20, therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with passion. Now he says tears, but that's the passion. And so if you say, well, I don't want to hear this part of the sermon this morning. Well, Paul said it's so important, I reminded you all the time to watch out for these guys. And the early church they had to fight against a lot of this going on. Many of the epistles, I'll come back to that, but let's get past this 17th verse. He says, contrary to the doctrine, doctrine which you learned. Well, causing church conflicts and spreading, and spreading false doctrines. Wasn't enough to start trouble, but they're teaching heresy. To the Thess Thessalonians, he writes... If anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Well, the hope was that he'd be ashamed and, be, and fix the thing. That's what he's saying there. Listen to me. You can't just sweep this under the rug. Watch. Pay attention. Heretics are usually sneaky. Jude says this about them. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. Well, how'd they do that? Well, they know what's expected of them. They're like sociopaths. They're up to something, and they're parasitical, looking for a living fellowship to live off of, to corrupt, and to consume. That will explain what's happening with the seven churches, or at least some of them, in the book of Revelation that Jesus addressed. For example, Pergamos and Thyatira. Churches in Galatia, Antioch, Thessalonica, Colossae, Pergamos, Thyatira, all of them suffered these types sneaking into their congregation. Peter dealt with it. John dealt with it. Jude dealt with it. Paul dealt with it. Jesus Christ dealt with these deceptive teachers and troublemakers. Revelation 2, Jesus speaking. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman... Jezebel. Now, that wasn't her real name. It's okay to use to call use names to describe their behavior. Jesus said of Herod he was a fox. Paul, when he was smacked illegally in the face, he said, God will judge you, you whitewashed wall. Or you're religious on the outside, but inside there are dead men's bones. That was where Paul was going until he found out it was the high priest that gave that command. And then Paul walked it back a little bit. But the truth had been stated. Anyway, Christ says, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants. Every church should remember that the servants belong to Christ. They do not belong to the pastor. They belong to the Lord. John writes, these things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. 
1 John chapter 2, verse 26, if you want the verse. And so Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's not fooling around. Satan's objective is to devour. And we shouldn't be fooling around back at him. And so Paul says, avoid them. Love does not tolerate Satan's seductions, which come through people. Love has to correct that which is wrong. You have a child and he wants to run out in the middle of the street. If you love the child, <laughs> you correct the child, because that's what love does. First Corinthians, I shouldn't say that, because not everybody has loving parents. We should remember that. Years ago, when I ministered to many of uh, the uh, construction workers, I would tell them about the father's love. And then the Lord expressed to me, he said, a lot of these men, fathers, beat them, come home drunk and beat them and gamble away the rent money, the food money. They don't have good fathers. And so I had to fix that. And the way I did that was I explained that very thing. There are bad fathers among men. There are good fathers among men. But our Father in heaven is pure and perfect, and there's no one like him. And, well, coming back, he says, avoid them. Love won't tolerate Satan's work. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6. This is the love poem of the Bible. Well, there's many of them. The cross of Christ is the greatest one. But in words, Paul says, about love, it does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Well, that's who we're supposed to be. You say, I fall short of those things. Well, keep moving. Don't give up. Don't fall further short. That's not right, but well, you know what I mean. Galatians 5, I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Now, I'm bringing that verse up to highlight Paul's righteous indignation for people coming behind the righteous work of the Holy Spirit and trying to undo it. Paul is talking about those who are coming to the church at Galatia saying, yeah, 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 fine, you Gentiles, you want to Christ, but you got to be circumcised. And Paul says, let them be mutilated. And the Greek word is stronger than mutilation. He wasn't fooling either. He wasn't putting up with that. The Galatian church seems to have recovered, but they almost did not. Most churchgoers don't realize how much dirt church infiltrators will sling. A problem or a habit of Christians is, well, I know Jesus, therefore I know Christianity. Uh, maybe not. How do you learn about the assembly? Not just by showing up. You've got to be involved to learn what goes on. And there are levels of learning about the things that Christians do behind the back of other Christians in the Christian assembly. Because the slinger appears caring and mature and the victims are undiscerning and immature, that's where the sheep begin to suffer. 2 Timothy 3, Paul says about these types having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. This fellowship is part of Christianity. It's a, it's a self-correcting mechanism Christ has built into the church. If a church is trying to grow its numbers, it won't use the self-correcting mechanism. If the church is trying to obey Christ, they will. And that's what he wants. Christ builds the church, says the Bible. And the Lord added daily such to the and the Lord added daily to the church such as were being saved, it says in Acts chapter 2. To Titus again he writes, reject the device of man after the first and second admonition. Don't keep playing this game. If he is divisive, he'll take out the flock. Deal with it. Do you recognize that at this very moment, you are getting doctrine? Do you understand this is a Bible-teaching church? 
I would bad, be bad-mouthing the work of the Holy Spirit if I said, well, I'm not a worthy teacher. Well, my opinion is that, but that evidently is not his opinion. And uh, that is the truth with all Bible teaching pastors. No, they're not worthy, but he makes them worthy. And it's the same for you when you share the faith. No, you're not worthy, but he makes you worthy. It's called anointing. It doesn't just happen to pastors in the pulpit. It happens to Christians on the field of ministry, in season and out. So do you understand that right now you're getting doctrine on dealing with troublemakers? Thus the many quotations of scripture and the background that goes with it. In verse, six, in verse 18, he says, For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. He says they're not Christians. They don't serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I cannot pray with a lot of people. I can pray for anyone, but I can't pray with anyone. So if a... A uh, Muslim said, let's pray together. No, I can't. I can pray that you convert to Christianity, but I cannot pray with you. We don't have the same God. We're not talking to the same God. An ecumenicist who believes you can pray with anybody. All roads lead to heaven. I can't pray with that one. The Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Christian scientists, the Unitarians, they're not Christians. I can pray, believe it or not, with Calvinists. I can pray with the Baptists, with the Presbyterians. I can pray with those who hold to the fundamental truths of the Christian faith as taught in the Scripture. But I cannot pray with anyone, and neither should you. The ones you can't pray with, you should be preaching to, looking to correct. Do you think Elijah said, hey, let's all pray with the prophets of Baal. These guys are passionate. He called fire down on them. Uh, well, he didn't. It uh, wasn't fire, but he called swords on them, and that's what happened. Well, coming back to this, he says, but their own belly. Well, he's describing parasites, opportunists, narcissists. There's a lot of words we have for people who do this, who are all about their agenda, even when it's not their place to have an agenda at any cost to you. They exist. The scripture says, hey, face this. Don't, don't, don't run away from it. You have to deal with this. It'll be all right. I'll be with you through the whole thing. When Paul is writing this, don't you know the pains that were going through his heart? The people he had to deal with who double-crossed him and the ministries and the work that he did? This wasn't all just righteous indignation. There was righteous pain, too, standing up to people you love who are wrong, who are harmful. He says about these that by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Who are the simple? Simple Simon met a pieman. <laughs> Let me taste your wares. Anyway, said the pieman to simple Simon, Let me see your penny. <laughs> Indeed, I don't have any. Anyway, <laughs> the pieman was shrewd enough to bust him. All right, I worked that into the same sermon. Anyway, coming back to this, their own belly, their own agenda. Untrained, untrained Christianity is not a virtue. It's not something to boast. Well, I don't know the Bible. Well, why not? You know, you know, you'll never exhaust it. You'll never touch the bottom, but you can go really deep. Ezekiel gives this image of a man stepping out into the water. And that is uh, metaphorically one coming into the faith. Then he says the man wades out a little bit more and he's knee deep. He's learning to pray. Then he goes a little further. He's waist deep. He's getting some power. You know, if you've had an injury to your midsection, <laughs> your strength is gone. Then he says the man goes out and he's swimming. And all you can see is his head. And the head of every man is Christ. That's what you see when you are immersed in the spirit. And the devil works really hard to keep us out of that, puts us in the flesh as best we can, and we, the war is on. Sociopaths disregarding the rights and feelings of others so they can get what they want. They can fill their own belly, he is saying about them. Psalm 55, David knew these types. He speaks about one of them. We're not sure who. It might have been Absalom. 
He says the words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords, unsheathed, ready to do damage, unholstered. In verse 19 now, he turns back to them, having this outburst of a father's care. You know, watch yourself, watch these guys. I don't want this to happen to you. I'm dealing with it in Corinth. I don't want to deal with it in Rome. In verse 19, he says, For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Presently, when he wrote, when he, the time he wrote this, this and other churches had their act together. A church can have its act together. A church can be doing the right things. First Thessalonians. He says the same thing about them. He says, for from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. I mean, this, this, this was a fledgling church when Paul was forced out of it. And they continued to grow. He did not abandon them. He sent Timothy and others back to them to work there, but which he was wont to do. He did this often. Well, I don't know. Do people really think that they are pleasing God when they decide disobedience to God is insignificant? Do they really think that somehow God is delighted about that? Well, that's a double-edged sword in this way. If you have someone who is being disobedient, to deal with them, you cannot be loveless. You cannot be a brute. You have to be firm, but you have to uh, not uh, hold them in contempt. So unless you become guilty, oh great, you mess up, now I'm walking the tightrope. <laughs> well, that's how it is. And you can walk that tightrope. Just be balanced. And that's what grace is. Grace is a very balanced thing. Some Christians are so afraid of being great. They're afraid that if they're gracious, they're going to somehow help sin along. You're not enabling sin by being gracious. gracious is, grace in Christ is never disobedience. Instead of Christ, he's full of grace and truth. And truth. Truth and love. If you have those two, you're going to have grace. You're going to take hits. Uh, you know, life keeps score in many ways. What are you going to do with that score? Are you going to let it make you bitter? Afraid to go to church? Maybe you got burned in a church. That is not an excuse to condemn all churches. It just means you got work to do. He says in simple concerning evil, be untainted, unmixed is the Greek word. May we be ignorant in evil, but not of evil. Verse 20, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. <laughs> Paul's having a hard time stopping this letter. He stopped it already in chapter 15. He's doing it twice in this chapter. Uh, it's, it's, all, it's, it's wonderful to see this outpouring of his love by this great man. If he was someone who never did anything, we would not value so much what he's doing. You know what an economy is? An economy is an exchange of values. That's what makes an economy work. Uh, I need a service, and I'll pay you for the service, and we both get, ideally speaking, a value out of that. Well, Paul... Paul brought value to Christianity. But so did a whole bunch of other Christians. And he's telling us that. Paul's love inspired hope. The pastor wants the congregation to leave the fellowship inspired from the things in Scripture, from the Word of God, because that has a better chance of sticking than anything else. The Roman persecutions will soon blow hard against this church in Rome. 
killing Peter and killing Paul and many others. So was this wishful thinking on Paul's part when he referred to uh, the God of peace will crush Satan? Or was he looking beyond this life? God always looks beyond this life. He doesn't look past this life, but beyond. He sees everything happening, and he's dealing with that, but he also sees eternity. He sees the things in the spirit. The words that I say to you are spirit. They are not flesh. They are true. Well, his, his disciples are the same way, and we are his disciples. When someone dies, we want to know, did they believe? We hope that they did. We hope that at some point God reached them. So not wishful thinking, but thinking that is uh, far-sighted. People need no help going to hell. You go to hell on your own. That's the problem. People need help finding the path to heaven. We, they need help. They need to hear that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, he's applying that to him. It, it does apply to him, Jesus Christ. We were just singing a song. Based on no other name. That's, that's Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so those who arrive in heaven have faced and overcome the devil, the flesh, the world. By following Christ. 1 John chapter 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And you say, I don't feel like I am sometimes. Yeah, but who is your Lord? Who do you bow down to? You bow down to anybody else? No, just to Christ. And he continues, John does. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Well, when does faith count? It's like loyalty. It only counts when it's being put under pressure. You can say, I'm loyal all you want. Well, what happens when you're confronted with something that's going to force you to choose? No matter what's going on in your life, no matter how you feel Christ is not doing enough for you, and if you stick around Christianity and you work for the Lord, you're going to have those moments. You don't have to grab hold of them. You don't have to pick them up. But they will be there. And you know what they're going to be? Shiny. Shiny. They're going to make you, it's going to glitter. It's going to appeal to a part of you, that sinful part, that fallen nature. You don't have to yield to that. And if you do yield, yield under protest. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That's a picture of somebody yielding, under, uh, not, uh, yielding to Christ and under protest against their own doubts. And what did Christ do? He answered his prayer. That's what he did. How can a loving God send people to hell? Boring question. You can do better than that, I'm sure. Is that your reason for not coming to Christ? The real question is, how can a pure God let impure people in heaven? How about seeing it from that perspective, God's perspective, and stop feeling entitled to blessings from God? God wants to bless, but... Often, man makes it impossible. Balaam was someone God wanted to bless. But Balaam went out of his way to make sure the blessing stopped. And he ends up being speared on the battlefield by the people of God. All right. How can a loving God send people to hell? Well, what do you bring to his table? What's so great about you that you deserve a seat in heaven? Well, these are questions that if you really ask yourself that, you might, you might just stumble into humility and call on the Lord and not ask those kind of questions. But those questions are asked by people who have been blinded by the God of this world. And that's what we're up against when we're trying to lead somebody to Christ. Satan is working against us. There's a dynamic, and it's not a good one. It would be criminal for any kingdom on earth to allow into its lands 
those who want to destroy that kingdom. Let's just say, hey, let's just open our border and let anybody in who hates us. That would be criminal. God's not doing that. If you hate God, the kingdom of heaven is not going to be open to you. He says, under your feet, ultimately Satan is permanently removed. But that's not all. We'll get to see it. That's the under your feet part. We'll get to see his destruction, his being cast into the abyss or to the lake of fire. We'll get to see that. We'll also get to see the uh, coming attraction when the angel snatches hold of him and chains him up. I don't know if I want to shake that guy's hand, but I sure want to see it. Victims of injustice are in scripture and because they're in life. Abel, how does that work out? He's worshiping God and he gets killed for it by his own brother. Job, he didn't do anything wrong. He did everything right. God boasted about Job. Joseph. Joseph suffered for upholding the principles of his faith. Mephibosheth. He didn't ask to be crippled, but he was. And then he was betrayed. Tamar. Jesus. You. Me. Injustice is a part of life. That should not make us give up hope. It should irk us to fight back in faith and persevere. Take the hits. Uh, you know, I, I, have you been to that place where God won't give you what you're asking for? And you know what you're asking for is good. But you have nowhere to go. There's no court of appeal. You can't twist his arm. So what do you do? Nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but your will. I will still serve you. Satan cannot beat that. It's, it's unbeatable. He says, again, under your feet. The church may oftentimes look weak and divided like the church in Corinth, but still it is a body of Christ linked to omnipotence, and Satan found out about that. He thought he had the church of Corinth. I was looking at a list of uh, my introduction to Corinth, and just, I was 23 violations that I have listed. There may be more. Everything from lawsuits against each other to carnality to sexual, I mean, just all over the place. Satan probably thought he had them, the way they treated Paul. But they lost, or they won. Satan was the one that lost that generation in that church because it's linked to the throne. Hebrews chapter 2, you have put all things in subjection to his feet. This is Paul talking about the Godhead and the Christ and his relationship to us and the Godhead. But now we do not yet see all things under him. Well, that's not, that does, that's not a game changer. It just means I got work to do. So he says shortly, in anticipation... Those first Christians lived in anticipation of Christ's imminent return at any moment. Now, I like to say this. It, they were wrong. As long as Peter was alive, he wasn't coming back. <laughs> they kind of missed that, even Paul. But they were so excited at the prospect of Christ coming back. We have many Christians today very excited about the prospect of the rapture. And that's what is was reading when Paul says he's coming back. The, and, and John even says, those who have this hope purify themselves. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Another outburst from his heart. Seven times in Romans, we find Paul shouting out, Amen. Three times in this chapter, in this section, this paragraph, verses 20, 24, and 27. You can't end the letter. <laughs> I, Tertius is writing down everything as Paul is saying. He's the one that, that um, wrote down the letter. Paul dictated it to him. We'll come to that in a minute. It's still by the pen of Paul. That's how we say it. Uh, anyway, uh, Tertius probably thought, okay, I'm done. And then Paul goes on, goes on again. <laughs> well, 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. This letter being read out loud, that would resonate with an assembly. They know what the word amen means. It doesn't mean period. It means trustworthy. It means you can, you can drive a train over this thing and it won't collapse. Verse 21, and, and I'm getting that from the original language. Verse 21, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipitar, my countrymen, greet you. Any of you who name any of your pets Sosipitar? <laughs> Timothy trekked much of the Western Roman Empire with Paul. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's consider the places he went, just some of them. We don't have an exhaustive, exhaustive list. Galatia, Ephesus, Troas, Macedonia, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, Rome, just to name a few. He shared in many of Paul's victories and his hardships, but perhaps the most poignant, he shared in Paul's hurts. He loved Paul like a father. When people badmouthed Paul, it hurt him. Emotional bruisings and lacerations come with serving Christ. Philippians, Paul writes about, and he hasn't written Philippian letter yet, but he will write about Timothy to the Philippian church, which was a solid church. He says, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. Well, here's the thing. Timothy served Christ and never stopped. John Mark did. He stopped, but he came back. And he was a valuable person to Paul. Bring John Mark. He is useful to me for ministry. What a blessing. He didn't say, no, that guy failed. He's not getting another chance. And if you're in Paul's position, that is a temptation. Because when you allow someone in a church to move into higher positions, there's a part of you that goes with them. And when it fails, it hurts. And so you just, you know, we'll just put a Band-Aid on it. Well, no, we've got a serious wound here. So you have to applaud the Apostle Paul because he and Barnabas, they were hot at each other, going at it face to face. I'm not bringing him. Oh, yes, you are, until they went separate ways. Already Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Nothing changed in his teaching. I hope, I hope you look back at this ministry and you say, you know, 20 years ago, it was the same way it is today. And 20 years from now, when I'm still up here preaching, <laughs> it's going to be the same. Because it was set on the foundation of Christ. And uh, what, there's nothing wrong with Believing in what you believe. Paul's last recorded words were addressed. Well, let me back up. There's something wrong if you believe in something that you believe that is wrong. But if it's right, then you go with the zeal of the Lord. Knowing that that is his joy. And if it is the joy of the Lord, it is your strength. It emboldens us to know that we're getting it right in God's eyes. Paul's last recorded words were addressed to who? Timothy, his beloved and faithful Timothy. These things mean something, especially as you interact with people and you find out, man, this, this human side of our Christianity is bodacious. And Lucius, Jason, Sosipitar, my countrymen greet you. Here's a short list of the faithful ones in Corinth. Not everybody in Corinth was a pain in the neck. A lot of them were great. That problematic church had good people. And it is from where Paul is writing this letter. So a brief review of the eight good names that are with him. Timothy, Lucius, Jason, Sosipitar, Gaius, Erastus, Tertius, Cortus. Those two are probably slaves. And we can't forget Phoebe. Because at the time he's writing this, she's still there. She's the one that took the letter to Rome. 
Lucius, he mentions here in verse 21, likely a longtime co-servant of Paul's ever since Acts 13, verse 1. And what happened in Acts 13? Separate to me Paul and Barnabas for the work of ministry, and they sent them out. I have a pastor friend who years ago, we were somewhere, and obviously we're always somewhere, and uh, he say, he, he, we were talking about his assistant, and he, he just matter-of-factly inserted into it, and he's been with me for 18 years. Because that pastor knew how hard it is to have good people stick with you through the years. The pastor's role is not to give good people a reason to leave. The pastor's role is to follow the Lord. And uh, I just, I always remember that because I know the value I know what that meant to that pastor when he said that. I know the hurt that he had been through. Well, verse 22, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Now, Tertius was the amanuensis. <laughs> That's the guy that wrote this down. In fact, the word uh, amanuensis, or as, as Paul uses, not amanuensis, that means something else, same thing, different origin of the word. Tertius, who wrote, the Greek word for wrote is grapho, where we get our English word graphics. This is a fun fact. Uh, so we can hear Paul say to Tertius, make sure you let them know you're writing this. The Holy Spirit's the author. Through the experiences of Paul, Tertius is the scribe, and a very valuable one. And Paul was very grateful for this. And so Tertius takes the time to say, I wrote this. I'm, he, he, we'll get to why he, I believe he's a slave. But he would not have done that without Paul allowing it. And I believe initiating it. So we say from the pen of Paul, because these are Paul's words, and it is proper to say that. Uh, that's what we mean. The writers of all our scripture were human. And sometimes they use an amanuensis, an assistant. That's what that word means. You can, I'll give you a few verses if you want to just see a few of them. 2 Samuel 23, verse 2. Isaiah 59, 21. Hebrews 12, 2. Um, the author and finisher of our faith. In 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is breathed in, is breathed into the writer by God, just like God breathed life into Adam. That's the idea. That is the same thing that happens to you when you come under an anointing for preaching Christ or standing up for righteousness. There is some evidence that Paul at this time in his ministry, was afflicted by an eye condition, perhaps contracted on his first missionary journey. And that's believed that he had a damaged eyesight because of what is written in Acts 23 when he didn't know that who slapped him and thought it was, he, did, he didn't know it was a high priest. Why not? He, he can see him. Well, he had eye problems. Galatians 4, 13 and 15. Galatians 6, 11. Paul at one point says, look what large letters I have written to you in my own hand. Because you're using large letters because you can't see. Well, you can see, but not as well. And so having Tertius do this was great. Uh, there are other places, but we need to move forward. So Tertius, a Latin, it's a Latin name. And we have evidence of enslaved people being named after numbers. Because Tertius means third. Now, this is not just Christianity. In secular, there are secular historians out there, and they're very passionate about what they study, too. And um, there are whole articles on this topic without even mentioning the Bible. And it's always good to see, uh, you know, uh, have uh, another view, especially when it matches your view. So it would have followed in this order in some of the houses of the slave owners who took this route. Uh, Primus would have been the number one. Secundus would have been two. Tertius, number three. Cortus, number four. Quintus, number five, and on it would go. Well, the British Navy, they call their second-in-command on a 
worship, number one. <laughs> so it's not too far-fetched to believe that. We get to verse 23, we read of a man named Cortus. So the secular world comes up with this. The aristocrats and the free people did not name their children after numbers. They would have named them after months, perhaps. They would have put that in their name. But it was the slaves who got these kind of names as a rule. Now, Christian slave owners were not necessarily sinning because they owned slaves. In many cases, the slaves wanted to remain with them. Thus, we have, whenever you see bond servant in the scripture, you're seeing the translators say, this is a slave who wants to be enslaved to this master. And it comes from the Old Testament when, you, when the slave was set free and says, I don't want to go free. I want to stay here a servant. And they take his put a hole in his ear and, and with an awl and say, okay, now you are a bond slave. But anytime the New Testament talks about servants, uh, well, not anytime, it's different words, but one of the main ones is slave. And that would have meant something in those days when people in the congregations were slaves or they knew other slaves who couldn't come to church, but they could catch up with them maybe at the marketplace or somewhere else. I would also add, you know, there's different types and levels of slavery. Sure, you know, what was human trafficking? There's no excuse for that. That's evil. But this is not what we're talking about. The slavery of the Civil War is not identical to the slavery that was in the ancient world and other places of the world. So if you have that stigmatism when it comes to uh, slavery, you might want to rethink it because many of those who were slaves were very grateful for the life they had. Uh, as slaves. Verse 23, Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Cortus, a brother. So he was black. <laughs> That's funny. He was, I don't, he may have been, I mean, but he's a brother, you know, anyway. <laughs> I just thought of that one. <laughs> so I hope there's nobody here saying, that ain't funny. It's a, it is funny. Lighten up. Life's got bigger problems than that for you. Well, the Gaius, this is likely not the Gaius of Third John that John the Apostle wrote to. It was a common name. This Gaius is a wealth, likely a wealthy slave owner. We say that because Paul is living with him and the church is meeting in his house. And those are clue, big clues, there are those who have interpolated, that means added to, the, man, the manuscripts, names for Gaius. I don't think they've got any grounds for it, so I'm not going to repeat the names. But if you have those translations and you see that they've substituted a name or maybe you've got a study Bible and they say, well, his name was really Justice Gaius, you know, this and that. Uh, maybe not. I'll go with Gaius. A very happy word. <laughs> as I mentioned, the common name. Now, uh, there's another Gaius in Derby from Acts chapter 20, likely not him, but this one likely is a Corinthian baptized by Paul. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 14, I thank God that I baptize none of you except Crispus and Gaius. <laughs> you see why that church had a problem with Paul and Paul with them? I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you people except these two guys. They're good. <laughs> so, man, that was the that was the fight going on there. Erastus, likely a man that Paul sent to Macedonia, Acts chapter 19. So he sent to, into Macedonia, which is in modern Greece, two of those who ministered to him, Tim, Timothy and Erastus. <laughs> but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. Well, when Paul wrote 2 Timothy, he mentions Erastus still in Corinth, which gives us, he, he's probably a Corinthian. Well, we also, and um, let's see if I missed anything with that. Uh, the treasurer of the city. So when Paul said, if you look at the faith, there aren't many wise. He didn't say there were none. There weren't many of prestige. There are some, and Erastus would have been, been one. That's a big position. He's not a slave. But Cordus. Uh, as meaning number four likely was 
in the house of Gaius along with Tertius. Well, what happened to Primus and Segunda, uh, Segundus? Uh, they, they may not have been believers. That's probably why. Verse 24 now. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. <laughs> okay. So Tertius says, okay, we're done. <laughs> and then Paul goes on to say, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, verse 26, and now made manifest by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, here it is again, according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. So obedience counts. So what is going on here? Well, we're established before God through, through Christ. We have peace with him, Romans 5, 1. But he is, um, that word according here means in agreement with. It means in harmony. It means attached to. So watch, church, be careful of those who are deceptive according to your understanding of Scripture. That's how it all ties together. Paul says that what he has preached did not originate with him. My gospel according to Jesus Christ. And when he's, he's owning the gospel like we do, this is my gospel. Ownership. You know somebody that's been going to a church for 20 years and still can't say my church? Something's missing there. At some point, he's got to have ownership. So, when Paul says, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, the preaching of Christ was consistent with the preaching of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience, because the preaching of the prophets originated with God, who's Christ in the flesh. The mystery, a mystery in Scripture is that which is either not yet revealed or has been revealed. And the great mystery of the New Testament church, and we're out of time to go into the verses, Ephesians 3, the first five verses, will give this to you. The great, one of the great mysteries of the church is the new, of Christianity, of God, is the New Testament church that has taken the Jews and the Gentiles and put them in together in one faith without making Jews Gentiles or Gentiles Jews. We're Christians. There's no longer Greek, nor Jew, nor Greek, Cynthia, uh, barbarian, not Cynthia, uh, Scythian, Cynthia, that's the word I wanted. All right, let's finish this. Verse 26, but now has manifest by the prophetic scriptures made known to all the nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God, verse 27, to God alone, to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Tertius is, uh, he's not putting his pen down. <laughs> he's, uh, he's not done. He's kidding with me. Well, God is without equal outside of the Trinity. And if you have a problem with the word Trinity, because it's not in the Bible, the word Godhead is. And so it's there. You're not going to get away from it. Remember the impact of this letter on this church. We covered this earlier. It was so powerful that when he finally sets foot in Italy, they come out f as much as 40 miles from Rome to Appii Forum and Three Inns to greet him, to welcome him, to love on him. Acts 19.15, and from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Appii Forum and three ends, when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. How much is missing from that? How much of the emotion that Paul, uh, Luke could not put into the words, he just said he thanked God and took courage. He didn't go, oh, thanks, God. I'm stronger now. That was emotional. Christ died. That is history. Christ died for me. That is salvation. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, just a fantastic scripture. May it, uh, may it take root. May it work more in our own walk with you to bring you glory. We pray, Lord, if anyone has been listening, watching, if they've not 
named you as Lord and Savior, that now maybe they can see from your word how trustworthy and meaningful it is, how precious is the faith that you've made available for sinners. If you are watching online or listening, or if you're here in the church and you've never opened your heart to Christ, you're being played like a fiddle by a very real devil. And you have a very real Savior reaching out to you and saying to you, come to me. I'll deal with your sin, but I need you to come to me. You have a chance to do that right now, or you can stay stuck in your sin. It's up to you. If you say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, I ask you to forgive me. There's no one else who died for me. There's no one else strong enough to take away my guilt. I come to you, and from this day forward, I ask that you would be not only the one that saves my soul from judgment, but the one that rules over my life. I give my life to you right here, right now. And now, Father, if anyone has made this prayer this morning, let them not be ashamed of their confession, but may they, Lord, step forward when invited and make their faith known. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.